Hello and welcome to the Goes T Virtual Social. I'm Kate Ramsayer with NASA and we're here at Kennedy Space Center to talk about the Goes T launch. Now Goes T is the latest in NOAA's series of weather observing satellites and Goes T series can see the entire Western Hemisphere from near the Arctic Circle to near the Antarctic Circle from New Zealand to the coast of Africa. But I'm here today talking to someone who's looking at a little bit more focused area when it comes to weather, Jessica Williams with the uh, Space Launch Delta 45 and the Space Force's uh, weather officer. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me, Kate. Excellent. And so the big question on everybody's mind, what is the weather looking like for Tuesday and scheduled launch then? Well, unfortunately, we've had this beautiful weather week that comes to an end starting on Monday. So the weather doesn't look great, but it doesn't look terrible either. The front moves through Monday, but it lingers just to our south on Tuesday. So we do have an enhanced risk of showers moving onshore, which could cause violations for our cumulus cloud rule and surface electric fields rule. Right now, we have 40% chance of violating for those rules during that two hour window or a 60% chance that weather will remain go for that whole window. Okay, and that was one of my questions is, is what is it about the forecast that uh, gives you a go or no go for, for, uh, for the launch? Good question. So we evaluate 10 lightning launch commit criteria for range safety purposes, and those are to prevent the rocket from triggering lightning or to prevent oh. natural lightning from hitting the rocket. And those are what would cause us to become go or no go on the range for weather. Yeah. Um, are you using the phrase goes or no goes for this launch or, or that's just me? All right. <laughs> we'll probably try to stick to no go and okay. go to avoid any confusion, but we might consider that. All, just right, for fun. all right. You could have that one. Um, so let's see. So what's your role as a weather forecaster for Space Force? Like what, what's an average day like or even a day leading up to a launch? Sure, so we actually start providing support for launches well in advance, even months in advance of a launch, especially for ULA launches, um, for ground operations that take place leading up to launch, such as spacecraft arrival, spacecraft transport, nice. booster mate, things like that. Um, we provide those forecasts. And then on launch day is our big day where we have more than one person supporting with a couple of us supporting, watching the radar, uh, flying a weather aircraft, and then the main elbow on console giving the go-no-go no go and the weather briefings. Excellent. So um, let's see. And, you know, another question, we're launching this weather satellite. Do you use the GOES series to, you know, develop your forecast? Is this one of the one of the elements that goes into it? Absolutely. We absolutely love the GOES satellites. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned before, uh, four years ago, we used to get images every 30 minutes. Now we get images every five minutes. So we use the GOES satellites uh, on day of launch extensively. That, we use it even more than radar because oh. you can see clouds developing um, where the radar may not pick up the clouds. So you can get way ahead and, and predict when showers or thunderstorms are going to form even before the radar picks it up. Wow. Um, and we also use GOES satellite imagery a couple days before our forecast is valid because we use it to validate the models. So if the model, um, say, has a front moving um, faster and we compare that time of the model to the actual real-time imagery from GOES and the GOES satellite has it further behind, then we can incorporate that into our forecast and slow the forecast down or things like that. Oh, interesting. That's great. Well, excellent. Well, we'll cross our fingers for good weather on Tuesday and if not that, on Wednesday. But uh, Jessica, thank you so much for joining us and uh, we will join you later also with a uh, chat with a forecaster from the National Weather Service. All right. OK, well, welcome back on Saturday. We caught up with Jessica Williams from Space Launch Delta 45, who forecasts the weather for launches like Ghost T. And today, Monday, we're checking in with Kevin Rodriguez, a forecaster with NOAA's National Weather Service, about how he uses GOES data and uh, what things are looking like for tomorrow, scheduled for launch at 4.38 p.m. So Kevin, welcome, and, and tell us a little bit about, you know, how do you use GOES series satellite data in your regular weather forecasting? Good morning or afternoon, everyone. Uh, like uh, she mentioned, my name is Kevin Rodriguez, I'm a meteorologist here at the National Weather Service office in Melbourne, Florida. So the GOES satellite has been a spectacular tool for us uh, to use in our forecasting um, here at the National Weather Service. And this applies to all the forecast offices across the country. 
and in Puerto Rico and uh, out in Hawaii, Guam, across the, the entire CONUS, um, the GO satellite has been very, very, a very powerful tool for us to enhance our forecast. One of the really important things that we use it for here in Central Florida is for the identification of fog and stratus. So before on the old GOES 15, uh, 13 through 15 series, it was very difficult to discern uh, which what, what was low fog or what, what was fog and what was low stratus clouds. And that can make a big difference for our aviation partners. Um, and we're doing forecasts for our airports locally here. And our busiest one is the Orlando International Airport. So those low clouds and fog can have a big impact. And now we're able to tell the difference. The, the satellite can actually, using different algorithms, can detect the difference between fog and stratus. And that's been a really big help when we're trying to forecast those conditions for the airports. It's a big help for the aviation industry. Um, another big uh, aspect of the satellite is its ability to detect fires. Now here in Central Florida, we have a lot of population and there's, not, there's a lot of areas that are not sparsely populated, but as say out in the plains, Oklahoma, Texas, uh, Kansas, you have these broad areas, big areas where there's no, there's not a lot of people. Um, and grassland fires can start that way and they become very hazardous if they can get out of control. But the forecasters can see on the satellite, it can detect where there's hot spots. So the satellite picks up the heat coming from the fires in these very rural areas. And then we from the National Weather Service can alert fire departments, county emergency management, other officials that can go out there and put those fires out before they become a hazard to people. And if they get closer to larger towns and cities, so that's been a really big help. And then for us here, the big thing is the enhanced ability to detect lightning. So with the GOES Lightning Mapper, we're able to see not just uh, cloud flashes uh, within individual storms, but big complexes, squall lines, even in hurricanes, we're able to detect the lightning that occurs within the eye wall of the hurricane um, now with this new GOES satellite. So those, those are just some of the few applications that we use here at the National Weather Service to enhance our mission of protecting lives and property. Seems like a good number. <laughs> That's a good yeah. good number of, of examples there. So, you know, you're in Melbourne, Florida, which is not too far from where we are now at uh, NASA's Kennedy Space Center. How do you work with, with Kennedy and with the Space Force to kind of prepare a launch forecast? How do, how do the different uh, groups work together? Yeah, so the, the, the launch weather, the actual forecast for the weather is done by the 45th Weather Squadron, which is within the Space Force there out at Kennedy um, and the Cape. So they're the ones in charge of putting out the official forecast for that. Um, our main coordination with them involves the use of our Doppler radar, just to make sure that uh, the Doppler radar is set in the specific mode that they need it to be in case there's an anomaly with the launch. Yeah. And we also coordinate with them and with the Brevard County Emergency Management, which is our home county here. And just in case there is some kind of anomaly, uh, we do play launch weather messages on the weather radio. So for Mariners, there's a very, sometimes a broad area that they have to stay out in, in the launch range as the rocket goes up. Um, so we play that message 48 hours, starting 48 hours before the launch. So that way folks are aware that, okay, I can't be within this range of the Cape uh, in the few hours leading up to and after the launch in case of, for the booster rockets that they come back in some cases. Um, so those yeah. are the two main things. And then we also coordinate if they have, um, just to, uh, in terms of the entire weather enterprise, uh, coordinating on the forecast. So they're the ones in charge of the launch forecast itself for the rockets. And then right. we provide the additional support with the radar and weather radio aspects of it. Yeah, we don't want any boats in the way. That's for sure. That's correct. Yeah, no boats. <laughs> so I know it's kind of been uh, a little a little touch and go. What is the weather looking like for tomorrow when it comes to uh, to launch forecasts? Mm -hmm. So we are, um, at least for the viewing public, there, there will be in the morning, there's going to be an area of low pressure that's developing east of Florida tonight, and it should be pushing away from our area tomorrow. But we are expecting a lot of clouds in the morning, so it will be cloudy, low stratus, but that should burn off and dissipate by the late morning into the early afternoon. And there'll probably be some cumulus clouds around in the afternoon, but it should be, the sun will be out. Um, yeah. There is a low chance of showers across, uh, right along the coast and over the Atlantic waters. There's around 20% chance for that in the morning. Um, what about in the afternoon? How are things? How are things looking around? Oh, four thirty-eight. 
It, it should be on the drying trend. Um, okay. Can't completely rule out uh, a stray shower or two around the area, but it should be the conditions should be improving um, in comparison to the morning. Great. Right. Well, we'll cross our fingers and uh, you know do a little weather dance or whatever. Um, whatever you need, anything, right? Yeah. Right. Um, anything else we should know about how how you work with goes and the and this goes series from Noah, or uh, you know what are you looking forward to with the having goes tea up in geostationary orbit? Yeah. So more data, please. That's always. Um, a big thing. Uh, looking back at the past series of ghost satellites, the, the updates came every 15 minutes. And now on a, now we get satellite a new satellite image every five minutes. Yeah. And with the advanced, uh, with the mesoscale sectors, we can get them every one minute. So we have now four sectors with GOES R and GOES S, and then we're gonna have six once we get GOES T operational. And that just provides much more detailed information it yeah. does, um, there's been a lot of research over the last uh, five years since the uh, GOES R went up uh, in terms of forecasting for severe weather. We're able to see much more detailed cloud features and how clouds start to develop. And sometimes during tornadic or severe thunderstorms, there's certain little things that we've seen in, in the satellite from a research perspective that tends to, that, that, that shows a trend if storms are getting stronger and forecasters have used that in an operational setting to enhance our tornado warnings, to provide more lead times for the public. So it's been, that's been exactly. one application of it. And also for tropical and, and hurricane forecasting, uh, we can use the, the satellite. Uh, we put the two goals mesoscale sectors together and you get an update every 30 seconds, which is incredible. So you can really see the detailed vortices within the eye of a major hurricane, for example. So the ones we've had in recent years, Ida, Laura, um, going back to 2017, Harvey, Irma, and Maria, there's a lot yeah. of very detailed information that we're now seeing. And this really is, in, in, the, in the future, we'll see this maybe 5, 10, 15 years down the line, enhancements to the way we forecast. Because now the computer models can ingest all this very detailed information. So it is going to make the forecast models better. And in turn, it's going to make the forecast that we provide to the public and our partners that much better. There's a lot of applications that we're just starting to scratch the surface of with Ghost Satellite, and you know, I'm excited for all the possibilities in the future. That sounds great, and I know I'm, you know, refreshing my uh, my weather forecast for the next for the next day for sure. So yep. for all the work you do, <laughs> and uh, thanks for joining us today, Kevin. And we'll uh, keep our fingers crossed for the cloud free skies tomorrow. And uh, thanks to all our viewers for following Ghost T uh, virtual social. Keep uh, keep it tuned here. Uh, to the event page and we'll have more for you coming up soon. Thanks so much. All right, thank you. Have a good one. Bye. You too.